different countries. I spent a night, spent a night in France. We moved over back into Belgium for one night, and from Belgium back into France the next night. I ended up at Zermont, France, as a checker on the railroad for five months. What happens is they were shipping supplies from Antwerp, American supplies from Antwerp to Paris. That was a through route from Antwerp to Paris. When they crossed the border from Hercules, Belgium, to Jumont, France, they had to put guards on every car that was American goods. Now, the French was running their regular trains, but on each of those tra trains, there may be one boxcar, there may be two boxcars, there's not more than two or three. And my job was to check it in and at the headquarters there in Zamont, and then assign two of these Japanese-American boys. There was about 25 of them there. There was three of us were checkers on the railroad. And they would let us know that the train was coming in. I would send the two guards out to the edge of the railroad where it crossed the border. And even though the train is slowed down and moving, one of them would swing up on each side. Now they had loaded M1 rifles to keep the French from looting it while it was in that yard before it went on through. And there's so many interesting stories told about this. Uh, the, some of the cars had already been broken into. If they had, then we as checkers had to take a French uh, worker with us. One of the fellows that worked in the big French and the other one I worked with, he couldn't speak English and I couldn't speak French. <laughs> but we knew what we were doing. And I did, uh, at that time I learned a word or two of French, but I, I didn't try because I had an excellent, the one that worked with me most of the time could speak English. And he, he was a fascinating young man. He hoped to come to America and go to school. But of course I don't know what ever happened to him. But there's a lot of interesting, or every day was an interesting time. Uh, it was a crisp, Christmas time was there, and the chef that was cooking for us, we stayed, we stayed in a French chateau, as they called it, and the, there was very little heat. There was nine and nine. One day there was an old Burnside stove in there. And one day the boys come in with some stove pipe. I never asked them where they got it. <laughs> they stole it, of course, off the, <coughs> off, the, off the branch, off of some building somewhere. So I have a picture in there. So they knocked out half of the window, put the stove pipe into this old Burnside stove. And then they go down along the track and pick up coal. <laughs> so we, we had a co I stayed in a room with three of these boys. One of them was a checker, Yasunaga. Uh, Hamiguchi was another. Domo Yokoyama became a very good friend of mine. I wasn't very big, but he was he was shorter yet. And they had fascinating stories to tell. But it was about Christmas time. We didn't have any sugar. Now the supply would come down from Charleroi, uh, Belgium. Was Ma Mons was the other town. We didn't have any sugar. They told us. I told the boys, the other two, to if ever a carload of sugar comes through, which we knew sooner or later they would. If it hasn't been broken into, it will be when it goes out of here. Well, it came in. One of the boys that was down there. I wasn't on duty, but they come up after me because the other boy couldn't leave his station. And <laughs> it was in a flat car with a tarp over the top of it. Big flat car, a French car, of course. And it was loaded with 100 pound bags of sugar. Well, we had to, we had to call for the weapons carrier, which was the only vehicle that was, was stationed there. We had to call for the weapons driver to come down and get that hundred pound of sugar. 
<laughs> we guarded, we stole from what we were guarding, but that, that's, that's wartime. That, yeah. you, you, you survived, you survived. And the Yasunaga was on duty one time and he sent one of the guards up said, Best, I need your help. I said, What's wrong? He said, I've lost two cars. They come in last night from Belgium, Edward Belgium, headed for Paris. And somehow or another, they switched them off the train. I won't say that somebody, they must have got the guards' attention some way. Anyway, they switched them off and took them out of the yards. They were gone, but we had papers to show that they were on the train. So I had one of them to send for the young man that could speak English, and I said, we've lost two cars. Yeah, yes, and all was on duty, and there's two cars gone. Do you know where they are? Well, I don't know. I'm not quite sure. I said, you just as well take me, and we'll take the weapons carrier and two guards, you just as well take us to where those are. I'll have the whole company to come down from Mons, That's a, that, and I wasn't joking about it. If we got into any difficulty, not try to solve it, he said, well, I'll take you. They, there was a sidetrack out, and it was around the point where you couldn't see it. They, part, they had these two cars. When we got out there, you could guess for a week, and you wouldn't know what those two cars were filled with. Whiskey. Oh, Going to the headquarters up in Paris. One of the cars had not been broken into, the other one had, and it was there were cases in there. Part of, Many of the cases was gone, and some of them, just bottles out of the cases were gone. And I had to try to make a list of that. That, that was part of my work. This fellow that, a Frenchman that could speak English, he came to me and he said, West, any more, you, you never saw Red Skelton, the comedian, I don't think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he wore a great big long coat. This this fellow, his name was Bob, he wore a long coat and it had two big pockets inside and so on. He said, you know, we haven't had anything in our home and we're poor, we don't have anything. Would it be all right if I took some of these? I said, I got to go check his other car. Of course, I, I didn't yeah. see him take him. But after we got through and got in the weapons carrier, he said, you know, West, if I ever fall down, you'll have to help me up. He had so many bottles in that <laughs> big old cake, coat of his. I said, did, did, you, did you select what? He said, I selected what my family likes. And, <laughs> this this is <coughs> the things that you experience. Well, I won't make the story too long. The picture you saw a while ago was a uh, it was a very good basketball court. I uh, being a basketball fan, and these boys wanted to know why we couldn't get up a team of basketball there. I said we can't find a basketball. Well, I decided I'll go get them. Get you one. I got on the French train going up to Mons where I knew there was the USO, United Service Organizations for Servicemen. I went to the USO and found out well, on the way up, I, I got on a train. I knew where I was going. The conductor said to, to Mons, I didn't know where to get off to find the USO. So after we'd gone a few miles, I stood up in the train. I said very loud, is there anyone on this train that speaks English? A young lady sitting at the far end, she said, I speak English, French lady. I went up and talked to her and sat down and talked with her. Till we got, and when we got to the place, why she, she notified the uh, conductor that she had a passenger that wanted off there, and I got off at the USO. I got a basketball and brought it back, and we got up a basketball team. And the French were just beginning to play basketball then. And I was one of those people that couldn't be still. If, if athletics could be had, 
just like it was back at Camp Stone, and I was going to do it. Some, some of them would just sit in the barracks or in the chateau and do nothing and worry about going home. I can't say that I didn't worry, but I tried to keep busy. So that's the way I got a basketball. So finally it came the day for us to ship out. And we boarded trucks and moved toward Antwerp, Belgium. At Antwerp, we were stationed there for weeks. We lived in tents. They were out in the desert like and it would blow sand up around the tent. In under the tent, there were five of us in the tent. We decided we'd had enough of that, so we got shovels, the little shovels that we had that we carried in a light pack. And we just banked the sand up around the bottom of the tent, all the way around, so it wouldn't blow under the tent. The winds were strong there. If it blew a hole in, in the sand and it began to sift through, we'd draw straws at night, and who was to get up and go out and bank up the sand <laughs> to keep it from blowing underneath. And finally the day come, we boarded a small ship, the Westminster. The United States built a great number of victory ships to bring troops home from the South Pacific. and from the, uh, They can only carry about a thousand troops. They call them victory ships. We were on the West, Westminster. The Westminster didn't ride as smoothly as the ship did when we went over because of the size of it. We landed, the first thing that we saw was the Statue of Liberty and it certainly looked good. I have pictures in one of the booklets that I have showing everybody was out on deck looking for the Statue of Liberty and the welcome, there's a ship comes out to, to welcome the ship in the harbor and I came back to Port Mead, Maryland stayed there three days and was discharged from Fort Meade, Maryland, uh, picked up, washed the home away, and I came back and I was discharged in March 46 after serving four years and 28 days. I was back to civilian life. That about ends my story, there's lots of things I could fill in between and happenings. Always looking for that human interest story. I've told many of them. I mentioned one or two. Uh, I want to back up and tell you one particular that I liked and I've told it many times. When we were on the train crossing Germany, we stopped at this demolished town. The engineers were working on the railroad up ahead, we were told. And we rode in box cars and flat cars, and we were riding in the box car. And I was sitting in the open door of the box car with a young man from New York. A little girl came along the side, and he struck up a conversation in German. He could speak German. He'd had it in high school, and they carried on the conversation a little bit. And finally, I looked down. I said to him, "Ask the little girl what she's carrying." She looked up. The bright eyes just spark as she said, I speak English. And I engaged in conversation with a little girl. She was carrying a German Bible. No place to go. She was just wandering. No food to eat. And she said that she had seen her father and mother killed. And she went to her grandmother, and her grandmother said, Now we're going to be separated because there's too much bombing when, when you survive this, I want to tell you three things to do. Number one, find the American. Find the American army. They'll treat you all right. Carry your Bible with you. And when they ask you what you are, you're going to say, I am somebody. The train started to pull out. The little girl kept walking wrong. And she said, take me with you. Let me climb up in there with you. I don't know whether I said or whether my buddy said, we're both speaking English to her. We, we can't take you with your We're headed to the front. I said, why do you want to go with us? I told you before, I am somebody. Thank you. Did you just stop
ставлю